I guess, uh, as you know, I'm transgender, and as a result of being transgender, I've lived life as the same person in two different genders, first female and then male. And I'm aware in a way that I think few people are, except for other transgender people, how differently men and women are treated just based on their gender identity. And uh, it's made me very aware and frankly very angry uh, about uh, the many barriers that talented women still face in every profession, not just science. And I just wanted to mention a few of them very briefly. I don't have time to go through all of these. Um, one thing I want to mention is, you know, I'm just reading this amazing book. It's, uh, it's called Keep the, God, Keep the Damned Women Out or something like that. Um, by where's Nancy Hopkins? Are you here, Nancy? No, Nancy is. Oh, sorry. Oh, she's not here. She would have remembered the name of this book and the author. But um, it's a book about how the Ivy League colleges decided to uh, finally allow co-education and let women in. And this happened in the late 60s. I was just starting college here at MIT in 1972. And frankly, I was so naive at that age, it never even occurred to me that women were ever kept out. Um, but this was all happening in the late 60s, early 70s. And I always thought the reason that these colleges went co-ed is it because you know there'd been the Civil Rights Act in 1964, basic fairness, women deserved equal education as men. That, that is totally not why colleges let women in. It turned out that as soon as some lesser colleges started letting women in, that the, the Ivy League's top male applicant choices, the, the very best men, were turning down their Harvard offers to go to these lesser schools. And so um, the, uh, it was essential for Harvard and Princeton and places like that to become co-education so they could get the very best men. It had nothing to do with women. When they initially changed, they didn't, weren't thinking about the welfare of women or how could they make the college uh, comfortable for women. And in fact, the truth is in academia, we still have a system designed by men for men. And nothing better illustrates this than the tenure clock. The tenure clock, I think tenure is so important, I would never suggest getting rid of tenure. Um, but the tenure clock doesn't work for women, to be very frank. And uh, you know, uh, I'm seeing now most of uh, women in my uh, lab often not choose to have babies, even as postdocs. Uh, and they often start their tenure track years with a baby, and then they often have one or two more babies. And yet they're on the same tenure clock that the guys are maybe uh, some, some guy somewhere decided, okay, let's let them have an extra year. I mean, who decided one baby is equal to one year? That's crazy. I think that's crazy. I've never raised a baby, but even I can tell that's crazy. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's fair. Uh, I think at the very least we have to start letting women who have postdoc babies have an extra year for those postdoc babies. In fact, at Stanford, our provost tells me for the last 15 years he's been provost that every single woman assistant professor who's asked for an extra year for their postdoc baby has been granted one. I certainly hope that's true here at MIT. I have to say, I was just telling Sue Hockfield, when I was here at MIT as an undergrad, there were so few women on the faculty. Um, and uh, it was a very different climate for women back then. And it's so exciting to come back today and to see so many fantastic women on the faculty here. And I think more than half of the people I'm meeting with today are, are fantastic women faculty. So it's, it's thrilling to see that we are making progress. We're making a lot of progress. There's still a lot to go. And this tenure clock, we, it's not a fair barrier. I have a suggestion. just want to make the suggestion. I like to make the suggestion in front of deans and provosts, because usually they pass out when I make the suggestion. <laughs> I think we should give the suggestion a try. I think you know, these days, the average young scientist does at least 10 years of training before they start their own lab as a PhD and then as a postdoc. Some of them even do two postdocs. To get a job at a place like MIT or Stanford, you've been very successful as a graduate student. You've been amazingly successful, again, as a postdoc. Then you apply to this really competitive job, and there's hundreds of applicants, and you win. Let's give that person tenure the day they start their job. Why not? <laughs> Why not? And if you think about it, you know, no system is perfect. Any system you're going to use is going to have pros and cons. But I would argue the cons of doing things this way are much less than the cons of doing them the way we're doing it now. It's completely unfair to women to put them on a 10-year clock right when they're running out of time to have their own children biologically. Um, and I would argue it's bad for everybody, male and female, to be on a 10-year clock. Why, when you're at the peak of your most creative time in your life, should you be put into a risk-averse mode uh, to get tenure? I, I think it's crazy. 
Now you could argue, okay, but what if we tenure the wrong people? Well, you still have to make promotions. And I think most people aren't gonna stick around in a tiny lab as a lowly paid assistant professor very long if they don't make tenure. So I, I, you know, at Stanford, everybody gets promoted. If you hire the very best people and you put them in a supportive environment, they're gonna get tenure. If they don't get tenure, you're doing something wrong. It's not the person's problem. So I think we should give it a try. Um, there's other barriers uh, I don't have time to talk to, but I did wanna just briefly, before I go back to Glia, uh, mention one last thing, which is sexual harassment. Uh, I've become very interested in this problem. Now let me just do a little experiment. I've never done this before. How many women are in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you women are, uh, have gone to biomedical research conferences like Keystone, Gordon Conference, Cold Spring Harbor? Have any of you gone to those meetings? Raise your hand. Okay, now if I have one more set of hands, and this is getting a little personal, so I understand if you don't wanna do it. I've never asked a crowd to do this before. I'm most curious. How many of you at one or more meetings when you were trainees, either graduate students or postdocs, how many of you were asked for sex by, generally it's a man, let's face it, by, but let's just say it, by a senior, by a faculty member, uh, since I'm just asking this question to women, let's, let's stick with men. How many of you have been hit on by a senior male? Somebody uh, like a faculty member, raise your hand one or more times. Okay, so if, not everybody, but a fair number. So I have uh, been asking this question, and I've been amazed how many women have told me that this is a frequent occurrence when they go to meetings. No matter how much they dress down, they're hit on. There's a famous neuroscientist, I'm not allowed to mention his name, <laughs> at least when I'm sober, um, <laughs> who brags about the fact that he's bedded, he's 60 years old, by the way, I'm 62, he's my age. He brags that he's bedded 200 women trainees over the years at these meetings. Uh, and I don't think me most men do, I don't think most men do this, but you know, it only takes a small percent of men to do it repeatedly to start to affect a large percent of women. I just heard another story where a woman was having this fantastic conversation at her poster, a postdoc was having this fantastic conversation at her poster with a famous senior scientist, whose name I won't mention, and she thought it was like the scientific conversation of her life, and at the end of the conversation, he took her hand and he wrote, his hotel room number on her hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want my students exposed to this. Uh, this is, it, it, it's so important to be able to, to mentor and exchange ideas at a meeting. Look, the older generation is hopeless. I'm addressing this to students. <laughs> when you're faculty, please, please don't do this. It, it very much undermines, the, you know, it's, it's sending a message to a woman that she's not valued for her science, for her ideas, but for sex, it's just wrong. It's wrong, don't do it. I don't care if they're your students or somebody else's students. Keep your hands off the students. And the students, what you do with each other, that's on you. 